Welcome to the penultimate talk in the Thames Luminaries virtual lecture series, a collaborative effort to celebrate our amazing local luminaries and their landscapes drawn to the area by the River Thames. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for these lectures. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to tonight's chair. Uh, she is a lecturer and a, le a literary historian and she's a fantastic luminary herself. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel, for that lovely introduction. Um, I should say that, that one of my uh, connections with this project is I'm also a trustee of the Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust, and we had a wonderful talk on, on Pope's Garden um, in the first week of the series. I want to welcome, uh, welcome you back if you've been to this series before. I know we've got some people who've, who've really attended lots in the series, and it's, it's lovely to know um, that there are people so fascinated with their local history and wanting to connect with these historic venues. And also if you're um, listening from overseas, welcome too. It, it, it's great to share this beautiful place with you. Say, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Minna Anderson, who gave a positively sparkling talk on Orleans House Gallery in our previous series. Minna frequently appears on Finnish TV. She studied as an official London Blue Badge Guide and guiding is to this day one of her passions as promoting as is promoting London as the ideal destination for a range of global corporate and incentive clients. She's also a volunteer with Orleans House Gallery and the Poppy Factory, using her skills as a speaker and guide to bring their history to life. So over to you, Minna. Well, thank you so much, Judith, for that wonderful, wonderful um, introduction and welcome to you all, sort of thousand odd people there in the audience and what an absolute pleasure it is and privilege and honor to be spend the evening with the like minded people sharing the stories of the Orleans House Gardens. The first inhabitant uh, was, in fact, this chap that we are now looking at. And uh, uh, this chap here was a Saika antelope. And Saika antelope roamed the, uh, the banks of River, River Thames two and a half million years ago. And uh, the Saika antelope, uh, uh, we know that he was the first inhabitant in the Orleans house, house uh, gardens. And uh, we found this skull of this two and a half million year old Saika antelope about uh, in, in, about in 1950s at the, at, the, at the back of the Orle Orleans House Gallery. Orleans House Gallery, this fabulous, absolutely stunning octagon room built by James Gibbs in 1720. And this room here, I mean, it just uh, glorifies everything that was Baroque, everything that was 1720. And um, also this uh, room is probably the earliest, um, earliest uh, tangible evidence what we had in the Orleans uh, gallery and in the Orleans house grounds, because, uh, we have very little evidence what was here before James Johnston moved here and before he retired here. Well, before here, we know that there was a house and fruit gardens in, in mid 1500s. In 1600s, there was also a house where Princess Anne, the future Queen Anne, came at the end of 1690, uh, well, 1690s with her very ill son. 11 year old son to recuperate, to have the sort of the air of London, uh, away from the pollution of London, to come to the countryside. And he is known to have played, this 11 year old lovely prince was known to have played in, a, in the um, um, island that was in the middle of the, uh, and is in the middle of the, of the, of the river. So, then we come to, um, and, and even then, I mean, this fruit garden theme goes throughout our, 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 our story. And we come to our, the gentleman, who we can thank for why actually we are giving this talk here. James Johnston. James Johnston, he was, uh, well, first of all, his father was executed under uh, Charles II. 
So the family had to flee to Holland. And there, while they were in Holland uh, in 1670s, 1680s, James Johnston, he was studying law. And uh, he was also just, he was like a sponge. He was absolutely getting all the new influences and fashions that was in uh, what was about to come into England from the from, from the uh, Europe. And here we have something what he, he really, really experienced firsthand. We are in Holland, where he spent a lot of his time studying law, as I mentioned. Het Lu Palace and Het Lu Gardens. This was the palace of the future king, uh, uh, William III, and his wife, Mary II. And uh, he was, this is something that he really remembered. This is what he took in. This is what he took with him back home when he then finally decided to retire from the very stressful job of being a politician. He was a secretary of state for Scotland. And uh, he retired to Twickenham. Well, why to Twickenham? Because that stretch of the river, let's say from Hampton Court to Q, Q um, um, Palace, few miles of the stretch of the river, that was the place to be. You were close to the court and all the sort of the nobility and aristocracy, they built their houses along the river. And past three weeks, we have uh, experienced, heard stories of these houses. So I always say that the stretch of the river uh, along Twickenham was a bit like Sloan Avenue of the day. That's where you retired. That's where you sort of came to show off and, and see. And that's exactly what James Johnston also did. He uh, uh, commissioned a fellow Scot to, to, to draw a house and build a house. And fellow Scott was named, uh, his name was James, uh, John James. And um, uh, he built something very, well, very plain. It was the style, the Palladian style that was sweeping across uh, England, very sort of um, uh, emulating the, the, the Roman and Greek style, plain, but extremely fashionable. And the architect uh, already said in 1710, when the house was built, that James Johnston has got the skills of the best gardener that he has ever seen. So what happened then uh, in, um, in, well, let's say sort of in 17, 17, uh, 1700s, like so many aristocratic men, uh, that was the sort of a time for the aristocratic gap year the famous grand tour, that the aristocratic men, they were as if it was one of their musts to do and, and, and explore Europe, explore paintings, gardens, explore um, uh, all sorts of new scientific ideas. It was the age of enlightenment. And our James Johnston, uh, of whom we will be speaking a lot more in a minute, also did that. But then also, this is quite so, something interesting, why I brought a, pain, or a book of William Sanderson from 1658, because these paintings kept coming as a souvenir when the aristocratic gap year uh, travelers returned back to the country. And quite interestingly, the numbers were quite staggering that between 1720 and 1770, 50,000 paintings arrived in England and 500,000 etchings. So people didn't quite know what to do with these, these paintings. So William Sanderson wrote a book, Art of Painting, and gave instructions where to hang your paintings, how to spot a uh, painting that is, is, is not real, where to buy paintings. And there's a lovely, lovely quotation, which I'm, I'm going to quote now. Uh, he gave advice where to hang his, uh, your paintings in your lovely country houses that you pay, built as a stage for those paintings. He says, and I quote, portraits of one's wife should be hung upstairs in private rooms 
in case they arouse adulterous thoughts in the minds of what he calls Italian minded guests. Just wonderful, just wonderful. And that didn't, oh, uh, the, 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 these guidebooks didn't just uh, apply to paintings. The guidebooks also applied to gardens. Because very important part of the uh, grand tour was the Italian section and uh, the Italian section of, of, of looking gardens. So here we have a Patty Langley. Patty Langley uh, is a local chap from Twickenham. Uh, at least he was baptized in Twickenham in 1696. And he was a gardener. He was a, uh, a garden designer. And he was especially uh, famous for Gothic structures and summer houses and very eccentric uh, gardens. So this book, his book of principles, of new principles of gardening is then uh, to sort of, uh, it, it has together all the sort of instructions and new ideas what to do with gardening. And, uh, and because garden, gardens weren't portable, you couldn't take the gardens with you. Although one Italian virtuoso is, is known to have said that if our amphitheaters were portable, the English would carry them off. Uh, so guidebooks were written, uh, garden books were written. And uh, Patty Langley's very famous uh, Pomona, or the fruit garden illustrated from 1728 contained sort of uh, all sorts of um, instructions con uh, concerning fruit gardening. And there he already singled out our James Johnston saying that he is a great encourager uh, of gardening. And look at this, we are now here in Twickenham. The, the, the guide uh, or, the, or the drawing on the left-hand side is made by Patty Langley. Patty Langley, the, the, the title of this is The Improvement of a Beautiful Garden in Twickenham Plan from 1728. James Johnston's house was built in 1710 and 1720 was this, the gorgeous octagon room where we started. And... Uh, he did a drawing, and how similar is this drawing than the beautiful gardens from Hetlu Palace in Holland? Absolutely nearly identical. And then the, 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 uh, the image on the right-hand side is then uh, uh, Roger Hutchins from 1999, where he's sort of imagining what the gardens looked like. Well, what was in the garden? We know that James Johnston is said to be the best, one of the best, uh, 20 best gardeners, at least uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in England. So what was there? There were two rectangular canals, mount. Mount was important because then you could stand on the mount and look out onto the river and the river views were completely unobstructed. There was a kitchen garden, uh, a pleasure garden, wilderness, grotto and a fruit garden and uh, and not all or only that but because he was really into fruit gardening first of all the climate was suitable and the ground and earth was very favorable for, for um, fruit gardening so he had a 16 acre cherry garden complete vineyard which I will be touching upon in, in a minute R very rare Duke and May cherries, and for Mona, this uh, Patty Langley's Garden Illustrated, praises uh, James Johnston's pear called Johnston's. I have not found any evidence. I am appealing to you, my lovely audience, if you can uh, connect the dots, if the pear is actually named after James Johnston, or if it already was in existence before. That is some detective work that uh, I have been trying to do. But anyway, there is and was a pair called Johnston's. And he also drew long canals that were then watering, watering his, his uh, uh, gardens. So it was really a sort of a 
proper civil, uh, civil, civil engineering, uh, engineering project, this whole garden. And uh, the influences came, uh, as we know, from, uh, from Europe, uh, very, 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 a lot from Europe. Two um, completely different drawings here. The one on the left hand side is of the time, just showing the extent, extensive uh, area that was taken over by James Johnston's uh, uh, crowns. So it goes all the way up, up to uh, uh, the, the, the Richmond Road up here and then river here. We have Marple Hill House just about here. So, so the huge, huge gardens. Two thirds of the gardens was all allocated to pleasure garden and kitchen garden. And uh, James Johnston's, this, uh, James Johnston's uh, this horticultural expertise was the expertise that people really tapped on. And uh, that's won most admirers for him. And what was quite interesting that he had the ability to plant large trees in the summer months which were traditionally done in the winter time. So he had this some kind of a, uh, he was born to do it. Uh, I, I always think like this. And Hoxton nurseryman in 1730, a gentleman called John, John Cowell said that, con I consider him to be one of the top 20 outstanding gardeners in the country. Well, not everyone quite agreed with his gardens and his gardening style. And one especially who didn't agree was his next door neighbor, Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope um, uh, despised, we can even use that word, despised the gardens, uh, the straight walks and elaborate parties and the French formality of it all. Uh, and he challenged, uh, that all was challenged. And, uh, and Pope loved this more natural approach to the gardens. He found uh, Johnston's clipped trees particularly distasteful. And this was sort of the Burlington set that really, really uh, agreed with, 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 with Pope's ideas. But then uh, I, I think he sort of the admirers were in a sort of larger, larger scale, because Colin Campbell from Vitruvius Britannicus, he said that the gardens are extremely curious, the plantation most artfully dispos disposed, and uh, everything contributes uh, to express the refined taste and great politeness of the master. Well, uh, there we are. I mean, I think that says it all. I wanted to take just as a contrast, the, the, the um, image on the right hand side is an image of uh, the garden as it was watercolored by Papworth, Papworth in mid 1800s. You can see that the, the, the estate and the gardens have already, already sort of uh, completely changed and, uh, and, and shrunk in a way that the estate certainly wasn't uh, uh, huge anymore. And there's a lovely, uh, there was a lovely in, in 1716, there was a, um, uh, and later on as well, a publication called Gentleman's Companion in the Business and Pleasure of Country Life. I just love, first of all, that the that, that title of a magazine is fabulous. In that um, publication, it was said that of the profits and pleasures of fruit trees, he strongly enforces the planting of vineyards. And James Johnston was one of the so, sort of uh, uh, earliest uh, um, enthusiasts to do uh, and, 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 and dabble on, on, on vineyards. Here we have a photo. We couldn't find any images of James Johnston's uh, uh, gardens, uh, the, the original gardens with, with vineyards. But hey, the image on the right hand side actually is a wine cellar as it looks today, which is underneath the circular um, uh, octagon room. So his wine cellar was there. 
And uh, of course, wine in the 1700s was the nobleman's drink. It was symbol of wealth and gin and beer, they were cheap. And uh, they, they, the noblemen, they were seeking to distinguish themselves from the, uh, the, the, from the alcoholic tastes of the lower class uh, 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 sort of compatriots. And wine was also a source of uh, polite conversation. And as the 1700s was the age of enlightenment, it's really the wine reflected that. And as we know, the Georgian, Georgians loved drinking. They, they drank here heroically. So this all then sort of uh, fits in together. So it, 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 you had to, in your sort of uh, noble aristocratic houses, being a gardener, uh, growing wines was uh, quite something. And Daniel Defoe, the, 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 who wrote, for example, Robinson Crusoe, he said that Mr. Johnson, Johnston, who is a master of gardening, perhaps the greatest master in England, has given testimony that in England, notwithstanding the climate, the air and the uncertain weather, he still produces most excellent wine. So there we are. Uh, it all happened here in Twickenham. And then a uh, gentleman, John Mackey, was saying that he slopes of wines of which he makes some hogsheads a year are very particular. Hogshead, 238. 7 liters. So there was a lot of lot of uh, wine being produced. And then, of course, another uh, sign of wealth was the ice houses. And we have heard of ice houses over the over the week, if you have been with us. Uh, they were they were in, in a lot of a lot of our properties from from this week. And uh, uh, first of all, the ice, it was sort of kept there for about a year. So it was ice. It wasn't to cool the food. It was just to keep the ice as ice. And uh, uh, the ice house was there. And then, uh, of course, Thames used to freeze the famous frost fairs between 600 and, and 800. Uh, sort of that you really got uh, uh, ice from the Thames. The Thames is known to have frozen 28 centimeters thick, the ice. I mean, that is quite, quite, quite a substantial thickness. And then, of course, Norway was providing ice, the famous ice uh, link between Norway and England. And, of course, then, uh, last but not, not, not least, that was in James Johnson's garden, was the greenhouse. And greenhouse, uh, again, was the sort of sign of wealth and, and nobility because they were so expensive. There was window tax and there was class tax. So only the wealthiest had the money to, 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 to build uh, greenhouses. And then also the wealthiest were trying to desperately to, to, to grow all sorts of exotic fruits. One of the exotic fruits that there were even competitions going on, who could um, uh, grow the first domestic pineapple. Pineapple, of course, came to England already sort of uh, earlier, sort of in the 13, 1300s. But uh, to grow this at home, on your home turf was expensive, difficult, took years and years. And um, it was so expensive that uh, that's why sort of most of the Georgian facades and, and, and uh, railings, there's very often a pineapple to show the wealth. One pineapple, if you went to buy one, cost about 5,000 pounds in today's money. And uh, uh, then you also sort of put that on the top of your, on, on your dinner table as a sort of centerpiece. And if you couldn't afford to buy your own pineapple, you could rent one. And I always sort of love this idea of these pineapples going from aristocratic house to an aristocratic house, being rented as a sort of show of wealth. But the reason actually why I brought this sort of uh, wonderful, beautiful fruit uh, into this talk is because the first documented homegrown pineapple in England was grown in Richmond. On Richmond Green, 
there was a Dutch uh, li lived uh, Dutch uh, merchant uh, Matthew Decker, and his gardener grew the first homegrown pineapple, 1714, exactly the time when James Johnston was doing doing his gardening here. So whether these two met, I would like to think. I have a romantic view that these guys, these two met and had a fabulous time together talking all sorts of. Uh, gardening related issues and here just so I wanted to show you the um the for now James Johnston has died uh, and this is now owned by governor uh, governor Pitt we are now in sort of 1740s and the the octagon room um the gardens had started to suffer but we see this 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 whole estate uh, river fronting and right on the on the right there's a sort of the the um boathouse that was sort of used as the uh, river river entrance okay we can't uh bypass these two men because it is down to these two men who actually gave the name orleans house the gentleman on the right uh, uh, sorry on the left is king louis philippe king of the french he lived here he was duke of orleans and he lived here for two years uh, in exile between 1815 and 1817. And uh, he gave his name, Orleans House, to, to Orleans House. And then on the right hand side is his son, Henri Duc de Mal. And uh, Henri Duc de Mal then lived here for 20 years. And uh, he uh, really left then an, an impact here. When uh, the king, Louis Philippe, was the king of the French, he came back to have a look at his beautiful home where he was so happy and this was in 1844 and he brought Queen Victoria with him and showed Queen Victoria he, his, his home and Queen Victoria just said that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty house very much embellished since the uh, king lived there but he looked so happy to see it and that makes me happy. So that was sort of a lovely, uh, Queen Victoria was brought here to have a, have a look at his house. And of course, then when the Duke de Mal lived here for 20 years, uh, this became the center for the French expat community. And uh, uh, here are sort of beautiful photos taken by French photographer Camille Sylvie in 1867. Uh, when there were sort of fets, there were balls, there were children's dances, there were sort of everything. It, it really was the expat community, and they kept very good care of, they took very good care of the crowns. And uh, there was a sort of a, a lady, Lady Kate, who uh, is known to have been a guest at the age of 17 at the children's ball. Uh, in in the uh, 1860s, and he, she was saying that oh, there were so many French princes, and I uh, danced with everyone. And Duke showed me his picture collection, beautiful pictures and paintings, but too close together. So maybe Duke de Marle hadn't read the uh, the uh, uh, William Sanderson's guide how to how to hang your pictures. So then we come to a uh, sort of late Victorian period, and here we have John Astley. And John Astley uh, uh, bought the, the uh, house in the 1870s, end of 1870s, turned it into a sports club, very exclusive sports club. There was an um, a entrance fee or membership fee, but uh, uh, it, it wasn't profitable. It really, really wasn't profitable. And, uh, and uh, he tried all sorts of things. And then what did he end up doing was, this will be a surprise. I promised you surprising stories. Uh, international cricket was played in the gardens of Orleans House. The gentleman here on the left is Charles Thornton. And Charles Thornton, um, uh, founded Orleans Cricket Club in 1878. And then he was said to be the, the uh, one of the sort of best batsmen uh, that uh, one of his big, one of the biggest hits uh, or one shot, he claimed that traveled 160 yards. And um, 
Astley and Charles Thornton invited the Australians to play cricket uh, on the grounds of Orleans House, and they played a two-day international match in July 1878, which was a draw. And the teams stayed in Orleans House, and uh, there was a lavish banquet and, and reception afterwards. And the Australians came to play for the second time in 1882, when another English uh, cricketing hero, W. G. Gray, uh, Grace, was playing for Orleans House. And again, that uh, international match ended in draw. Well, all the beautiful stories, unfortunately, come to an end. And uh, as the house uh, uh, changed hands many a times, many a times, in the end, in 1926, the house was uh, and the crowns were sold to uh, gravel merchants to excavate gravel. And this photo is taken in 1926, just before the gravel uh, merchants uh, move in. But all the fixtures and fittings have been removed if you, if you look at the house. The, interestingly, the photo on the left-hand side, I just wanted to put it there because it is from the end of maybe 1880s, but the same tree is there. So the, so the tree is still there, but the demolition started and 200,000 tons of gravel was removed. And, uh, but luckily, there was a savior living next door. Nelly Ioannidis, uh, who lived in the Riverside house next door, she was very wealthy. She was a collector of uh, uh, pictures and porcelains, and her family wealth came from the Shell Oil Company. So she got, uh, got the idea, and as a sh shock and horror, as she was witnessing the, uh, the demolition happening on her doorstep, she bought everything that was still for sale. And she managed to save the, 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 the priceless octagon room, four, tree, four trees and the crowns. And when she died in 1962, she left uh, her, her about 450 paintings and the estate to Twickenham Barrow. Uh, and that, that then uh, has been the nest egg of the, the um, uh, Richmond Barrow Art Collection, which is housed in Orleans, Orleans Gallery. So then we come to today. And uh, the today, uh, it is a thriving park and, uh, and uh, kept going by the volunteers. And uh, uh, interestingly, uh, London still today is classed as a um, forest. So there, are, I always love, love it when I in, uh, welcome my, my guests to forest when they come to London. There are more trees in London than people. And that uh, then gives us the authority to say that we are actually uh, 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 a forest. So how all this is being brought together then that fingers crossed in April, all going well, there's a next exhibition, a part of a three year program called cultural reforesting, which looks at arts and ecology, which is sort of sounds absolutely exciting. But uh, just to sort of coming as we are coming to an end and this beautiful evening photo of the octagon room. We started two and a half million years ago looking at Saika antelopes. Today, uh, Orleans House is a colony for bats. That's why the, the lighting is kept rather, rather dim. There are nine species of bats have been recorded within 500 meters of the gallery. And two species are seen frequently. One is common pipistrelle, which weighs five grams and can eat 3,000 tiny insects in one, e one night. And the other one is brown long-eared bat. And that brown long-eared bat can hear a ladybird walking on a leaf. I mean, the stories that keep coming from this wonderful, wonderful place. 
So the story of Orleans uh, Gardens uh, is one of absolutely deep change and seasonal charm. And especially when this rampant cow parsley is in flower. In the beginning, I promised to take you on a journey. Journey through this amazing shared space with very complex and deep ecology, which we have now seen from antelopes to bats. And I promised also that the journey would be peppered with stunning finds and surprising stories. How did I do? Over to you. Because I think two and a half million year journey, we have gone from psycho antelopes to bats, from kings and queens to noblemen, and most importantly, from the pioneering passionate gardeners to modern day heroes who give everything they can to make sure that this beautiful space stays preserved for the future generations. And on that note, James Johnston's wine, this isn't, but I would like to cheers all the garden enthusiasts around the globe. Thank you for joining and thank you very much. <laughs>